In the early 1950s, some senior officers thought that all US Navy carrier aircraft would be vertical takeoff machines within the next 10 years. History would prove them wrong, but it would allow for the development of some truly interesting designs, one of them being the Ryan X-13 Vertijet. The need for VTOL-capable aircraft was a relatively new one, albeit highly relevant. World War II had shown the effectiveness of carrier-based aircraft, and a VTOL-capable aircraft would reduce the need for a large flight deck, meaning carriers could be built smaller and therefore be hard to detect. The advent of the nuclear bomb and the subsequent arms race to develop ballistic missiles prompted the need for decentralization of strike forces. Aircraft carriers fulfilled this need to a degree, but large air bases on land were still very vulnerable, as, well, they couldn't really move. However, VTOL aircraft could be spread over many smaller operating sites, not needing massive runways, and therefore reduce the overall risk of loss. In the 1940s, Ryan had developed the FR-1 Fireball, an unfortunately named aircraft that really deserves its own video, which was a mixed power fighter, meaning it was both powered by a traditional piston engine and also by a jet engine. It was indeed quite powerful, so powerful in fact that when the aircraft was low on fuel, it almost had a 1 to 1 thrust ratio, and engineers began to mull over the idea of it being able to take off vertically. By late 1946, this general pondering had evolved into more serious technical discussion, and it caught the interest of the US Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, who awarded Ryan a contract to investigate the technical challenges involved in developing a vertically launched jet fighter. The idea of being able to launch a strike aircraft from a submarine platform was incredibly attractive to the Navy, and this venture would form part of a greater explorative experiment with this end goal in mind. One of Ryan's chief design engineers, Ben Salmon, was tasked to the project and began drawing up preliminary design configurations, the main concerns of course being the power plant and control. In March 1947, Salmon presented three of his designs to the Bureau of Aeronautics, all of which were different configurations of what he called at the time Model 38. They would be powered by a Rolls-Royce Neen engine and would utilise reaction control as the primary means of keeping the aircraft stable during non-aerodynamic flight, i.e. when it was hovering, taking off, or transitioning to more conventional flight. The proposals were well received, and subsequent development and research led to a contract funding the construction of an unmanned flying demonstrator, which first flew on October 20th, 1950. Remotely piloted, it was a strange and frankly ugly affair, powered by a General Electric J33 turbojet engine. However, subsequent testing and improvement led to the proposal of a newer, more advanced version of the Model 38 design. Powered by the still under development J53 X10 turbojet, it was predicted to have exceptional thrust to weight ratios, and this new design would also feature an armament of four 20mm cannons, the previous designs so far being unarmed. At this point, however, it was late 1953, and post Korean War budget cuts were having a knock on effect in hampering naval R&D projects. Many programs were being cancelled, and Ryan were concerned that their project would be next the Navy being highly reluctant to grant several development requests in the previous 12 months. Ryan still pursued further funding from the Navy, but they also approached the Air Force with a similar design aimed at accommodating their own specific needs. This proved to be a very sound move on Ryan's part, as the funding from the Navy all but evaporated at around the same time they were awarded their first study contracts by the Air Force. Two new research aircraft were to be constructed, and they were to receive the designation X-13. This project, much like the earlier Navy design, was to assess and demonstrate the suitability of easily dispersible VTOL attack aircraft. The X-13 was designed and built by a new team under the direction of Chief Engineer Curtis Bates. The aircraft, born out of their efforts, was a compact, single-engine delta-winged fighter. The only unusual features of the aircraft, at least to a casual observer, was a pair of winglets and a fixed set of landing gear. The fixed landing gear was added to accommodate the decision to test fly the aircraft in conventional horizontal flight before attempting any VTOL operations, as the conventional flight characteristics of the aircraft were still unknown at the time, and it was considered smarter to see if it actually flew at all before trying anything more extreme. 
The X-13 became airborne for the first time on the 10th of December 1955. It was only a brief flight that lasted about 7 minutes, as the test pilot noted that the aircraft had a serious and terrifying oscillation problem about all three axes. To combat this, a roll and yaw damper was installed, which provided much needed stability and allowed the flight tests to resume. After the conventional flight program was concluded, with no serious disaster thankfully, things moved on to vertical flight testing. The X-13 was mounted vertically upon a steel tube truss with wheels that served as an initial vertical attitude landing gear, a curious setup that led some engineers to nickname it the Pogo Gear. For these initial, strictly vertical tests, the ailerons and rudders were removed from the aircraft to keep things simple. These early tests were very successful, and following this, test pilot Pete Girard made the first piloted vertical takeoff and landing on May the 28th, 1956. By this point, the X-13 was now powered by a non-afterburning Rolls-Royce Avon RA-28 engine. The engine provided a maximum thrust of 10,000 pounds, which was more than adequate for vertical takeoff, as the X-13's takeoff weight was only around 7,200 pounds. The aircraft was compact, with a length of just over 7 meters and a 6.5 meter wingspan. It had a maximum speed of 560 kilometers an hour and a range of 307 kilometers an hour or 167 nautical miles. For VTOL operations, the X-13 had no conventional landing gear. It used two small, non-retractable bumpers on the underside of the fuselage in conjunction with a semi-retractable nose hook. The nose hook would support the entire aircraft as it hung from a short section of steel cable. The cable itself was suspended between two arms that were themselves attached to a special articulated trailer that could be moved vertically 90 degrees from the horizontal. That being said, in practice, the cable could be suspended between any two strong stationary objects, like a pair of trees for example, which allowed for great flexibility of the launch system in terms of physical location, meaning it could be in the middle of an airbase or it could be in the middle of a forest. For conventional takeoff and landing, a tricycle landing gear could be attached to the aircraft, however this was considered a secondary configuration and mostly relegated to testing rather than proposed service use. The transition between vertical and conventional flight was relatively straightforward. The X-13 would lift off from the trailer and then move into a stable hover before accelerating into a vertical ascent. As the aircraft picked up speed, the air would flow over the control surfaces at a faster rate. Eventually, when a suitable velocity was reached, the control surfaces would be effective enough for the aircraft to rapidly pitch over into conventional horizontal flight. Landing the X-13 was essentially doing these steps, but in reverse, which may sound rather difficult, but it actually proved to be relatively easier than first thought, albeit with a couple of caveats. In general, the execution was easy, although the final stages did have some problems. The pilot's seat pivoted 45 degrees toward vertical during landing. However, the pilot still had to approach the recovery trailer blind with the underside of the fuselage facing the arms and the catch wire. It required constant radio communication with a ground observer to get the X-13 into position, and a 6 meter long pole marked with gradations attached to the top of the trailer gave the pilot an indication of his distance from the landing point. Despite the difficulty, Pete Girard quickly built up a base of experience in testing the X-13, and initial spot landing tests were very encouraging, as the average accuracy on most tests was better than 2 feet. In May of 1956, the second X-13 had arrived at Edwards Air Force Base for testing, and soon completed its first conventional flight tests. It then went through a series of incremental hover tests, using the same pogo rig as the first prototype, and also completed numerous hook tests. This was done to adjust and develop the aircraft into its final configuration for the next major stage in the test program, which began in November of 1956. On the 28th of that month, the X-13, piloted again by Girard, took off in a conventional way and ascended to 6,000 feet. Girard then slowly pitched the aircraft nose up until it was hovering in place. For several moments, the aircraft hovered in this vertical attitude before Girard pitched the nose down and resumed conventional flight, thus concluding the first VTOL transition of a jet-propelled aircraft in history. Another milestone was then reached on April the 11th, 1957, when the X-13 took off, transitioned to conventional flight, performed a series of flight maneuvers, transitioned back to vertical flight, and successfully landed using its hook on the suspension cable. 
the entire test was completed without incident and proved that horizontal flight to vertical attitude landing was possible. After this, transitional flights were conducted regularly, allowing Ryan and its test pilots to build up a wealth of knowledge and experience. Eventually, confidence in the airframe and pilot's skill was high enough that the X-13 was transported to Washington DC for a demonstration in front of the Pentagon. Test pilots Lou Everett, Pete Girard, and Bill Immenshur completed a series of demonstrations, eight being done at Andrews Air Force Base and one at the Pentagon itself. The Pentagon demonstration occurred on July 30th, 1957, in front of a crowd of over 3,000 military officers and journalists. The demonstration was a complete success, with the X-13 taking off vertically, crossing the Potomac River, and landing at the Pentagon. Sadly for Ryan, this was going to be the aircraft's only moment in the limelight. Following the visit to DC, the second X-13 was returned back to Edwards Air Force Base. There, it joined a program for exposing Air Force and Navy pilots to the concepts, peculiarities, and requirements of VTOL aircraft. This program continued throughout the rest of 1957. However, Ryan had halted any further development of the X-13 as they were waiting for funding from the Air Force. Unfortunately, the funding never arrived and the program was cancelled in 1958. After this, no other support for the X-13 was found, as the Air Force and the NACA had shifted their interests and efforts to the field of space activity with the development of the X-15 program. The first X-13 was due to be loaned to the US Air Force Orientation Group for two years as a static display, after which it was to be given to the Air Force Museum. However, the second X-13 was accidentally prepared for this task. Its original destination was the Smithsonian Museum. Instead, the museum received the number one X-13 airframe with some surplus equipment. <laughs> 